Greetings everyone, I am Dr. J, and welcome to Through the Looking Glass, where I take a look at old games I haven't played before to see if they hold up. I'm a sucker for a good flight combat game, so what better place to begin than with the one franchise that I never got into as a child, Descent. I grew up on flight sims and Star Wars games, which is why I'm somewhat surprised I didn't spend more time with Descent. I remember playing the third game a little bit, but all I remember is not liking it due to getting stuck early on and giving up as a result. It's not that the game was bad, it was just very different from what I was used to, having already played games like Crimson Skies and Free Space 2. The reason for this comes down to its origins, as while Descent is technically a flight sim, since you're piloting a spacecraft, the actual gameplay is more akin to the game's origin, the classic FPS. Before Half-Life was released, first-person shooters were radically different than they are now. There was less of a focus on the story, somewhat due to technical limitations, but also because most gamers who played first-person shooters weren't terribly interested in the story to begin with. As a result, the focus was almost purely on the gameplay, since there wasn't much of a story for gamers to latch onto. To get us invested, the action always started immediately, and more time was put into the levels, creating intricate mazes to actively explore in order to progress, find secrets containing easter eggs, more health and ammo, or in some cases really powerful weapons often earlier than you might necessarily find them otherwise. Back when Descent was released, most of the classic FPS on the market were Doom clones, as that was the big boy in town that everyone wanted to be like. In order to stand out, Descent added 6 degrees of freedom to the mix, allowing you to move in every possible direction in a 3D space. This might have been a nice gimmick on its own, but in the context of a classic FPS, it was game-changing, not only affecting your ability to move, but also meaning the level design could be far more intricate. And yet, with the decline of classic FPS, we haven't seen much of Six Degrees of Freedom shooters either, so in many ways the Descent franchise is a relic of the past, and one that is seldom emulated successfully. Was it left behind because it's not worth returning to, or because it's simply hard to get right? Let's find out. The story is the least important part, so let's get that out of the way right now. You are a mercenary working for the Post Terran Mineral Corporation, or PTMC. They are a company which operates a substantial number of mining facilities across the solar system, and have found themselves in the thrones of some kind of alien invasion. What they call an infection has turned their robots against them, and their only recourse now is to go into the mines and destroy everything. That's where you come in. Your job is to destroy the infected mines and in doing so halt the infection before it can spread to Earth. What little dialogue and such is there does the job as you would expect, but since the game doesn't focus too heavily on it, apart from now, I'm going to disregard the plot from here on. Still, for those who do want a more substantial story, that can be a factor to consider. So while I won't factor it into my final recommendation, it will be noted as a negative. And now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's talk gameplay. In keeping with the story, your objective is almost always the same. Destroy the main reactor, which for some reason is also armed with heavy plasma cannons. In order to do so, you have to gain access to it by finding certain access cards which for convenience I'll be referring to as keys from here on out, allowing you to open the matching color-coded doors. Once that the reactor is destroyed, you need to make a break for the exit before everything blows up around you. If you are able, there are also hostages in the mines, which you can try and free as a side objective. This is where the simplicity and cleverness of the classic FPS is most obvious. At its core, shooting at enemies until they die while not getting hit yourself is fairly simple, but they don't rely on those mechanics alone. By having you actively search for keys, they immediately train you to take your time, be methodical, and keep an eye open for anything that might help you. Had there been no reason for exploration, then there wouldn't be a reason for the maze-like level design, making an integral part of the game largely pointless. The best part about it is that there are, as mentioned earlier, plenty of secrets, some more obvious than others, and if you're able to find them, they can give you a huge power spike. The only way to regenerate health, as it were, is to beat a level and that only brings the amount of health and energy you have back up to half your total capacity. If you want to survive, you'll want to go looking for those shield and weapon pickups. I was able to start over partway through the game and still hold my own against a fairly hard level because I found a really powerful weapon in one of the secret compartments. There are also three secret levels that can be accessed by finding and leaving through hidden exits, which are really cleverly hidden to where I couldn't find the last two on my own. Some secret areas will have evidence of a door, others will look like just the wall apart from some discoloration, there will be other discolored wall tiles to keep you guessing, and some which aren't obvious until you shoot or bump into the right place. Finding these can be challenging, but the good news is that the map you're given is surprisingly useful. 
Since that you're dealing with 3D maps, it's quite often that looking from one direction will block out another room or hallway. So instead of using solid walls, they use a wireframe to outline the dimensions and thicker lines to mark where doors are. There are some places where it becomes really hard to get your bearings, but for the most part it works really well and is really useful to tell where you haven't explored, and where you may have inadvertently opened a secret area. Because it's a 3D map, they allow you to look at the map from any angle you wish, using your movement controls to change the position and the fire button to recenter on your ship. Even if you've moved around quite a bit, it's still fairly easy to reorient yourself, as there are a couple of lines coming out of your ship's marker, the longer one pointing towards the direction you're facing, and the shorter one pointing above you. If that isn't enough, then there's an option to enable something called auto-leveling, which will reorient your ship in what the game considers upright. The levels themselves also use a different color for one surface, which acts as a floor of sorts. My only major complaint is that, besides some occasional frustration, it doesn't do a good job at marking where the exit door is. And until you actually destroy the reactor, it looks like an ordinary unopened door. Because of that, it can be harder to know if you've explored everything unless you know where the exit is. Especially in a game where you're trying to look for any unexplored path, it stands out like a sore thumb, and it would have been nice if the exit doors had been marked. Besides that, the level design is well done, to the point where even an element I thought I would hate end up being well implemented. In certain parts of a level, you have to deal with robot spawners, which when you pass will start pumping out a certain number of robots. At first, this seems like a bad idea, because in a game where you have a limited amount of health and ammo, such a thing would be antithetical to that style of gameplay. And yet, the way in which they were used took advantage of them really well, adding gameplay variety by making you more frantic whenever they were involved, either trying to fight them or dashing to the nearest escape route. It's a system that had the potential to be really unfair, but for the most part, it's done in a way that adds to the game rather than makes it more frustrating. With the level design in good shape and secrets everywhere, does the combat make it worth doing all this exploration? In general, it does. Your ship starts out with basic laser cannons and a small number of straight-line missiles. As you play, you can upgrade your lasers to make them more potent, find other weapons such as homing missiles, more energy weapons, and some really powerful missiles that you can't use very often but are devastating in the right condition. There isn't a huge amount of variety in the weapons, but there is plenty of strategy within each. The Spreadfire, for instance, fires three plasma projectiles in alternating vertical and horizontal lines. If every shot hits, it can really hurt making it good at short range and intercepting missiles. But if you want something more usable at long range, then you'll want the rapid fire plasma cannon or your lasers. Yet, despite that bit of strategy, there really isn't much reason to use your other weapons once you max out the default laser. It might not be very good at destroying enemy projectiles, especially those evil homing missiles, but it's really hard to go wrong with four projectiles per attack, each one hitting pretty hard. I had hoped to see more variety, but by the time you're halfway through, you've seen Herb use pretty much every weapon in the game. Granted, you do have to pick your weapons back up if you die, and if you die after destroying the core, then you lose everything. But apart from losing some extra missiles and a life, there isn't much of a penalty. As long as you abide by save early, save often, it's usually not a problem, as the number of lives I had left over can attest to. Perhaps the reason this stands out in my mind is because, while I was playing, I might have been at too low of a difficulty setting. In keeping with classic FPS, there are five difficulty levels which change how much health and ammo you get per pickup, how hard enemies hit, and how many shots they fire per volley. The default difficulty is the second to lowest, which I recommend to most people starting out. And at first, it was the right setting for me. I wasn't playing super regularly since I also had college and a CRPG to deal with, and I hadn't used my joystick since the last time I replayed Free Space 2. When I was able to spend more time with it, and after I got the hang of the controls, it wasn't nearly as challenging. Still, after doing some of the other difficulty levels, maybe I was at the right one, as the difference between Novice and Hotshot was a lot more drastic than I expected, and Insane Difficulty is true to its name. These are the first enemies you run into, and they can kill you in seconds if you're not careful. I will admit that I haven't tried to beat it on Insane, mostly because it's hard as hell. If you want a challenge, you will certainly find it. And I do think it's worth playing through at least a second time because of the jump in difficulty. My lack of surety comes from how the difficulty didn't seem to progress in a linear fashion. Barring a couple of melee robots, every enemy uses the same or similar weapons that you do, making it easier to break up which robots are more annoying to deal with. In order to keep up the level variety, they change up the robot composition on each level. And depending on which robots you run into, it can be a complete breeze or absolutely evil. 
Part of this is because there are some weapons that the robots really shouldn't have been given access to. Pretty much every weapon is either a missile or projectile that you have to dodge or avoid the lock of. The only exceptions to this are the proximity bombs, which can be avoided or destroyed at a safe distance, and the Vulcan, which is essentially a chain gun. From the perspective of a player, having it is a good thing, as it's not necessarily the most powerful weapon, but can come in handy if you're running low on energy, the common ammo used for every other primary weapon. Giving it to a robot was a huge balancing mistake. Since that every ranged weapon is a projectile, that means before running into the robot that uses it, you get used to dodging projectiles and occasionally hiding behind something to break a missile lock. When you run into the Vulcan robots, however, the only way to avoid immediately taking damage is to kill it before it can turn to hit you, or by finding a rare invulnerability and or stealth power-up, which don't last very long. To be fair, they can be easily destroyed, but in a game without regenerating health, having anything that can immediately take off a huge chunk of health, with very little counterplay involved, shouldn't exist. Within the context of the game, it makes sense that the robots would use the weapons you're finding as you keep moving throughout the mines. But as this game made apparent, the story and world don't matter as much as the gameplay, and the Vulcan robots were a thorn in my side because of that. That's not even going into the fact that you run into cloaked Vulcan robots, which is even more infuriatingly hard to avoid without, again, a cloaking device or invuln pickup. And even then, you have to see the darker silhouette of the cloaked unit because you don't have the projectiles to guide you towards them. And by the time you do see them, there goes a decent chunk of your shield. It takes a lot to piss me off in a video game, and these stupid robots manage to do it. The only other balancing problem I have is the infamous level 7 boss fight. In two of the levels, the cores are replaced with bosses, both of them holding a tremendous amount of power. Not only do they use some of the most powerful missiles in the game, but they can teleport, have limited cloak before and after teleporting, and are often accompanied by even more annoying robots to boot. The level 7 boss fight is especially egregious, because it was the result of shareware. For those who don't know, shareware was the old way of showing off PC games, by putting parts of multiple games onto a disc free of charge. In theory, if you liked what you played, you would buy the full game itself due to the good first impression. In order to effectively show the difficulty of the game, they had to include the boss fight at level 7. Not only should it have been a midway boss fight, by many reports the original boss fight in the shareware version was virtually unbeatable. A giant robot that fires a missile which can kill you if it lands a direct hit and will severely damage you if it lands near you? It was literally harder to deal with than the final boss fight, because at least that one recognized this thing is going to be evil to take down and gave you plenty of pickups to help you out. Apart from that, however, the balancing is overall pretty good, and even if you die and or lose all your pickups, there are usually plenty of chances to get your weapons back. Despite how unforgiving the game can be as a classic FPS, it gives you a lot of opportunities to make the comeback real. Add on to that the ability to start from any level you've unlocked, except for the secret levels, and even if you aren't the greatest, you can still get through it. At this point, a good number of my complaints have been largely nitpicks, where some aspect of the game could be better. But the reason those moments stand out more is because the mechanics and core gameplay loop is relatively simple. That's not to say that they don't do some really interesting stuff with the gameplay loop, because they do. There's a level where you have to kill certain robots in order to retrieve the keys. There's a level when you can see much of the mine right off the bat, but have to put in some effort in order to actually access it. The levels themselves last as long as they need to, typically taking between 10 and 30 minutes, which don't individually overstay their welcome. And yet, I can't shake the feeling that it wasn't quite enough for the game's length. There are 27 levels in total, plus 3 bonus if you can find them. But it doesn't feel like there are quite enough unique moments to justify the game length. Sure, all the levels are well designed, but they start to become less memorable over time. Killing the robots to get the keys is an interesting idea, but it's only used for one level, and it isn't incorporated with traditional key retrieval. There are only two boss fights and a lot of time between them, so why not put a third one in between the two we have? It feels like all that's needed are just a couple more things to make it go from a great game to an amazing game. To some extent, my opinion might be due to not being quite the target audience. Since that this game was around back when arcades were more common, there is a score system where completing pretty much anything gives you points, be it destroying enemies, rescuing hostages, and so on, with more points being awarded at the end of the level depending on how much of your energy and shields are left, whether you died, whether you lost the hostages as a result of dying with them in tow, and how accurate you were. There is some incentive to get as many points as possible, as you get an extra life after a certain number of them. But outside of that, I'm not a score attack person. 
It seemed like the developers were banking on the sheer enjoyment of improving the different difficulty levels and the level design itself to keep people invested. But since that I don't care about score, it's harder for me to really get invested in how well I'm doing beyond the physical feeling of getting better and actually beating a harder level. Perhaps I've become too used to competitive multiplayer, but I'd prefer to measure myself against others in a more tangible way. Despite that, I still have a huge respect for the game, and I do like how well designed the enemies are, the feel of the weapons, and so on. This was one of the first games to have full 3D models for almost everything, relying on sprites for only the hostages and pickups. And considering that almost everything is a robot or machine, it works really well. What's even more surprising is that they pulled this off while only using hardware rendering, which even if computer hardware was comparable to ours today would still be less efficient. The designs themselves aren't all that interesting, but they're varied enough to be distinct, which is what you really need in an FPS, and there's never a point where something looked out of place. My recording software gave the middle finger to the lava effect, but the three-frame animation they use is still serviceable. What I found surprising was how well done the audio was, especially the music. For a game that only lasts 8 to 12 hours, there is a surprisingly large amount of music, all of it pretty good. You can find more than one version of each track depending on where you look, as audio hardware standards were a lot less consistent back then. But what you hear in-game is really nice to listen to. It fits the aesthetic well and does get stuck in your head. Though that might be because I heard it a little too often while trying to beat the stupid level 7 boss fight. Also, it has more cowbells, so naturally I have to love it. I got a fever! And the only prescription is more cowbell. <laughs> Overall, there is a lot to like. The level design is great, the enemy and weapon variety are decent, and even though I do have my problems with the balancing and variety, at its core it's well designed and did a good job at making their gimmick an integral part of the game, and in a good way. It might not be one that I'll spend hours replaying to find every nook and cranny, and it might not be as good as I expected based on the reviews I read, but it's still a good game. You can find it bundled with its sequel over on GOG. Wait a minute. Apparently, despite Parallax getting spun into Outrage Studios and Volition, they technically still exist and haven't been receiving royalties from Interplay since 2007? I have no idea who the guilty party is, but for our sake, it doesn't really matter as all of the old Descent games got pulled. Well, that's wonderful. At least while I was writing this script, the games were still on Steam, so at least I can point people to- OH GOD DAMN IT! Interplay, Parallax, whoever the guilty party is here, do you want your game to get pirated? Because this is how you get your game pirated. It's a crying shame too, because Descent is second only to Half-Life 2 for the best game I've reviewed thus far. And yet if I want to recommend it, right now I can only point to piracy or an old game disc, if you can even find it. I'll leave an annotation if it's reinstated, or if another legitimate way to buy the game opens up, but this is really frustrating. If you can find it, it is really worth your time, and I only hope that whatever might happen, it comes back as soon as possible. However, if you're able to find it, bear in mind that this is what the game originally looked like. Since I was also doing a Let's Play of the game, and because it came out before Field of View sliders were common, I installed a mod called DXX Rebirth which natively runs the game outside of DOSBox and adds support for 1080p and higher frame rates than 30fps. I try to avoid using mods when I'm critiquing something, but since it's easy to install, I definitely recommend it. Also, since that this is a 6 degrees of freedom game, I would also recommend playing it with a joystick, as while well, keyboard and mouse work just fine, typical WASDA movement isn't usually enough to get the full range of motion. That's all I have for this video, thank you all for watching. Please consider liking and sharing this video if you find it deserving, and keep an eye on this channel for the next game in Through the Looking Glass, as well as other content posted on a not-so-regular basis. Also, for you naughty little youngsters watching, this is what I meant when I was talking about a joystick. I was not referring to something else, you uncultured, perverted swine. And now that I've got that image in everyone's head, here's some Descent music to distract you while I go see if the second game is any good. Until we meet again.